Hi, welcome to part three in our exploration of Islamic art in West and Central Asia. Um, in this segment, we're going to be looking at um, some sculpture and um, some textiles and some more manuscripts. Um, so the Maluks, um, the majority of whom were ethnic Turks, were a group of warrior slaves who took control of several Muslim states and established a dynasty that ruled Egypt and Syria from 1250 until the Ottoman conquest um, in 1517. The political and military dominance of the Mal Mamluks, and I'm probably again saying that wrong, it's spelled M-A-M-L-U-K-S, was accompanied by a flourishing artistic culture um, renowned across the medieval world for its glass, textiles, and metalwork, which you're looking at an example here. Master metal craftsman Muhammad um, Ab Ab Al Zan created this brass basin during the Bahri Mamluk reign from 1250 to 1382. Um, inlaid with silver and gold, the basin's wide central outer band depicts a finely crafted um, procession of Mamluk emirs, I M I R S. These were um, bow bearer. Um, Oh, sorry, and um, bow, a bow bearer, um, um, and this is uh, Bundu Kwadar, that's the, that's the Arabic word. Um, four horsemen and roundrels punctuating the procession of dignitaries may be um, personifications of different aspects of horsemanship, or Vasuvia. And again, I, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these. I need to go back and, and check, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, friezes of animals and coats of arms frame the exterior band and decorate the basin's interior as well. Um, the basin is an example of an object produced for one ceremonial context, but later appropriated for another. It was probably commissioned by a wealthy Mamluk patron to serve as a banqueting piece or alternately as a vessel for ceremonial hand washing. Ultimately, however, it ended up in France where it was used for at least the 17th century in the baptisms of children born into the French royal family. So it's a very interesting history in, in sort of that, um, the way it's traveled. Um, the various coats of arm on the basin were... Um, were later worked over with fleur de lis. Um, here's sort of an example, I think, here. Um, a motif that might have appealed to both the basin's original Islamic and later European owners. The flower was a popular Mamluk emblem in the 13th and 14th century, as well um, as a heraldic device of the French royal family. So this piece, um, like the video, we saw some examples of this kind of metalwork in that video we looked at. Um, and, and you can see this was related to this idea of color and how um, the, de the design element of color was very important in Islamic art, even so much so that um, they created this sort of technique of mixing different metals. Um, so you would have silver and gold and, and bronze sort of inlaid together to kind of create that, um, that idea of color. Um, on the outer surface, the decorative panels um, interspersed with round rule um, form four scenes arranged in a sort of X symmetry. Two of them depict um, Malmuk emirs of the Sultan's inner circle. Um, depicted full length, they wear small turbans held in place by strips of cloth, double breasted robes um, in the Tartar style, and um, supple boots that sometimes um, sport um, blazons. Um, they hold the instruments of their office, um, um, a mace and an axe um, and a sword. The master of the wardrobe um, is bent under um, weight of a bundle of fabrics. A silk cloth hangs from his arm. Um, at the head of each group, a young mamluk prostrates himself as if to pay homage to the horseman um, in, in the roundel that you see here. And two opposite panels, there are huntsmen and officers um, of the chamber. So 
So the inside of the basin is also decorated. Um, there are four oblong panels depicting two hunting scenes, the two battle scenes, all of them very eventful. Um, four round rolls separate them. Two of them contain a, a monarch on a throne surrounded by the great secretary with a writing case and the master of arms with a sword. Um, all these scenes stand out against a background of, of um, some sort of leafy um, vegetation. They are all edged with friezes of animals, um, passants and, and courant or fantastic creatures. The bottom of the container is also decorated um, and that has a ring of aquatic animals including a crocodile. On the outer and inner rims above each scene is a small lily in a round roll, which makes a total of eight um, blazons. So here's some more details. So it really is quite intricate and beautiful. Here you can see, um, you know, both human and, and animal figuratives um, being depicted. So this obviously was a secular object, not a, a sacred object. It ended up being used in a, in, you know, in a Christian sacred context, which is, which is interesting. Um, the piece, perhaps commissioned by Christians, um, pursued its course outside the Muslim domain. It entered the collection of the King of France um, at an as yet an undetermined date. While it does not figure into the inventory of Charles the, the fifth, we know that it served as a um, font for the baptism of Louis the <clears> Thirteenth, <throat> celebrated in 1601 in the chapel of Chateau um, de Venaises, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. As for the ap appellation um, or the title, Baptistry um, de Saint Louis, which was given to the object in the 18th century. Um, it's just sort of an erroneous title. The form of the basin suggests the date from um, after the 13th century and that it could not have belonged to Louis um, the Ninth, who died in 1270. Furthermore, a baptistry, is, a baptistry is not an object, but actually a building next to a church. So despite its um, mysterious um, Provence and exactly you know, who it belonged to and how it ended up in, in sort of French royalty, um, definitely what we should appreciate about this piece is um, you know, this intricacy um, and this um, really beautiful expression of um, a utilitarian object. You know, this is you know, both a beautiful, aesthetically beautiful object as well as um, you know, a functioning object as well. All right, let's move on. Now we're going to get into textiles and we're going to be looking at carpets. Um, carpets are woven works of art that were produced at every level of society in the Islamic world. Um, women have been weaving for centuries in villages and nomadic um, encampments all over the Middle East. Um, each woman passing down her technique and designs to her daughters. These women created carpets both for sale and for their own personal use, and this tradition continues today. Carpets were also made in the royal courts of the Islamic world. Um, these carpets were not just functional floor coverings, they were ornate works of art that indicated the status and wealth of their owners. Court carpets were used on the floors in reception halls, audience chambers, and at court supported religious institutions. They were all presented as in, they were also presented as impressive gifts to other rulers. Um, manuscript paintings of the 16th and 17th century suggest smaller rugs were often layered on top of larger carpets and also show that many carpets were used in outdoor pleasure pavilions as well. Um, rulers have um, rulers had access to expensive materials such as silk um, and metal wrapped thread um, and employed the most highly skilled designers and weavers in their empires to create enormous and luxurious carpets. Because of their quality, design, and skilled execution, court carpets are among the finest examples of art um, from the Islamic world. Court carpets are often very different um, from carpets made in commercial workshops or villages. Rather than solely utilizing century-old traditional motifs, court carpets often share designs found on a range of media such as book binding and manuscript painting. 
Although carpets were made in many royal courts, the Ottoman um, from 1281 to 1924, um, the, Safa, the Safid from 1501 to 17, 1732, and the Mughal from 1526 to 18. 58 um, empires provided some of the richest examples of royalty um, produced carpets. So this is the one that we're going to be looking at in great detail. Um, this is the R. Debil carpet. Um, it's an exceptional one. It's one of the world's oldest Islamic carpets as well as one of the largest, most beautifully historically important carpets. Um, it is not only stunning in its own right, but is um, bound up with the history of one of the great political dynasties of Iran. And here gives you a sense of the scale and how big it is. Um, so again, carpets are among the most fundamental of Islamic arts. They're portable, typically made of silk and wool carpets. Um, were traded and sold across the Islamic lands and beyond its boundaries to Europe and China. Those from Iran were highly prized. Um, carpets decorated the floors of mosques, shrines, and homes, but they also could be hung on walls of houses to preserve warmth in the winter. Um, Artabel and um, the 14th century saint. Um, the carpet takes its name from the town of Artabel in northwest Iran. Artabel was the home to the shrine of Suf. Um, saint um, Safi al Din Ardabali, who died in 1334. Um, and Sufism um, is sort of this idea of Islamic mysticism. Um, he was a Sufi leader who trained his followers in Islamic mystic practices. After his death, his following grew and his descendants became increasingly powerful. In 1501, one of the descendants, um, Shah Ijma, um, seized power, um, united Iran, and established um, Shah uh, Islam as the official religion. The dynasty he founded is known as the Safids, and we had talked about them in, in our last segment a little bit when we were looking um, at the, um, the Great Mosque. Um, their rule, um, which lasted until 1722, was one of the most important periods for Islamic art, especially for textiles and for manuscripts. So this carpet was one of a matching pair that was made for the shrine of Safi Adin Ardabali. Today, the Ardabali um, carpet dominates the main Islamic art gallery in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, while its twin is in um, the LA County Museum of Art. The carpets were located side by side in the shrine. So this is sort of a depiction of what it must have looked like. a detail of it. Um, the pile of the carpet is made from wool rather than silk because it holds dye better. The knot count of a carpet still directly impacts the value of carpets today. The more knots per square centimeter, the more detailed and elaborate the patterns can be. The dyes used to color the carpet are natural and include pomegranate, um, rind, and indigo. Up to 10 weavers could have worked on the carpet at any given time. Um, the Ardabo carpet has 340 knots per square inch. Um, today, a commercial rug averages about 80 <laughs> to 160 knots per square inch, meaning that the Ardabo carpet was highly detailed. And it's like in that video what they were talking about. It's almost sort of like pixels when you take a picture. Um, the more pixels um, you have, the more detailed and the higher resolution that image is going to be. And so it's sort of the same idea behind these knots um, within a square inch um, when constructing a carpet. Um, its high knot count allowed for the inclusion of an intricate design and pattern. It is not known whether the carpet was produced in a royal workshop, but there's evidence for court workshop um, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, so let's talk about the design and pattern um, in more detail. The rich geometric pattern, um, vegetative scrolls, floral flourishes, um, are very typical of, of Islamic art. Um, reach a fevered pitch in this remarkable carpet, encouraging viewers to walk around and around, trying to absorb every detail of design. 
um, that the design of the carpet was not arbitrary um, or piecemeal, so it wasn't like just randomly put together, um, but it is a well-organized and, thought and thoughtful, and that can be seen throughout. Um, considering the immense size of the carpet, which is about 34 feet by 17 feet, um, which is impressive, a central golden medallion dominates the carpet. Um, it is surrounded by a ring of multicolored detail ovals. Lamps appear to hang on either side. We'll look at those in a minute. Um, but I have a detail of that. Um, the carpet's border is made um, up of a frame with a series of cartouches. Um, these are rectangle-shaped spaces for calligraphy. There's a detail of one um, in front of you filled with decoration. The central medallion design is also echoed um, by um, the four corner pieces. Here's a detail of the lamp. Um, art historians have debated the meaning of the two lamps that appear to hang from the medallion. Um, they are different sizes, and some scholars have proposed that this was due to create a perspective effect, meaning that both the lamps appear to be the same size when one sat next to the smaller lamp. Yet there's no evidence for this use of this type of perspective in Iran in the 1530s, nor does this explain why lamps were included. Perhaps they were included to mimic lamps found in mosques and shrines, helping the viewer to look deeply into the carpet below them and then above them to the ceiling, whose similar lamps would have hung, creating a, a visual unity within the shrine. Um, there's also an inscription. Um, it includes um, a four-line inscription placed at one end of the carpet. The short poem is vital for understanding who commissioned the carpet and the date of the carpet. The first three lines of poetry read, Except for thy threshold, there is no refuge for me in all the world. Except for this door, there is no resting place for my head. The work of the slave of the portal, Mask um, Kashani. Um, Masu, I'm saying this wrong, Masqad, I think it's Masqad, um, or Masad, was probably the court official charged with producing carpets. By referring to him as a slave, he may be presenting himself as a humble servant. The Persian word for a door can be used to denote a shrine or royal court. So this inscription may imply that the royal court patronized the shrine. The carpets would have probably taken four years to make. That's a long time. The fourth line of the inscription is also important. It provides the date of the carpet, um, AH 946. Um, the Muslim calendar begins um, in the year 620 CE when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. This year is known as the year of um, the Hajra or flight. Um, um, AH 946 is equivalent to 15, 1539 um, CE. The lunar Muslim calendar does not exactly match the Gregorian um, calendar that we use in the West. All right, so um, let's look back at the carpet in its entirety. So really the design of the Arbidel carpet and its skillful execution really is a testament to the great skill of the artisans at work. Um, in northwest Iran in the 1530s. I mean, it really is is quite beautiful. Um, I mean, I and it really what you'll see too when we go back um, to Europe, medieval Europe, and we look at manuscript um, illuminations, um, we'll see you know something very similar happening in terms of the motifs and designs. Um, in fact, some of the some of the pages from these uh, medieval Christian um, Bibles are referred to as carpet pages because they're so intricate and um, decorative. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I do have a part four. Um, um, I forgot to add um, two manuscript pages. Um, so we will look at those when you come back from Thanksgiving break. So stay safe um, and work on your flashcards. Make sure you watch um, the online lectures um, fully. <laughs> Don't, you know, just write a few notes and then think you're done. It's really important to watch these lectures. And um, anyway, 
I will see you guys later. Take care.